Well, first off, thanks for coming on here, Re. Thank you for having me. Of course. So, getting this thing started and getting right into it, would you be able to give us a little bit about who you are and what the Enlightened Living Meditation Center is all about? Yeah. Who am I? Oh boy, that's like such a loaded that's big question. One. Yeah, that is the big one. I would say that I am a facilitator. I mean, I'm a divine being. But beyond that, I am a facilitator helping people to have a space that they can dedicate to themselves for spiritual awakening, spiritual practice. I'm all about the practice. Mm. So I have a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of courses all about how to do the work and then bring that work into our everyday lives. Because if we're not bringing it into life, it's useless. It's just a waste of time. So the practices that we do in the formal sitting meditations are really intended to just have like a bridge into our everyday lives. So that's who I am. Um, That's what I, I do. And I guess that would be also what the Enlightened Living Meditation center is all about. I wanted it to be really, really accessible for people. So online felt like a great way to do that. I love in-person meetings and I think they're very powerful, but not not everyone can meet in person. It felt right to do it on Zoom. And actually it started really during COVID. That's when I really started having larger meetings. So it made sense for people then and it's grown. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that we have Zoom and we can meet like this virtually through time and space, it's a miracle. It is an absolute miracle. I'm thankful for it every day. I'm thankful for the internet, even for AI. I'm like, this is like, what great tools, as long as we're it's using magic. them right. It is magic. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And you're right, as long as we're using them right, as long as they don't use mm. us. Yes. That's the key. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe we can touch upon that a little later, but I want to get more into what the practices are, what the work is that you try to show people. Does it really just revolve mostly around meditation or how would you explain that? Right now we're doing a Kundalini activation boot camp and that is more energetic than the usual practices that we do in the community. It's a lot of breath work, something called bandhas, which is a yogic practice of constricting certain muscles and drawing the energy upward from the root chakra to the crown. There's so much involved in that. And to get into that is, would be a little bit beyond the scope, I think, of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, so right now, it's a lot of energy practices. But usually, historically, we've done a lot of sitting meditation, discussion groups, and I do something called micro practices. I teach micro practices so that people can take these meditative states, these higher states of consciousness into their job, driving a cart, doing the dishes, all of these ways of kind of touching base with spirit over and over again throughout the day. So it's integrated into their lives. So it's a little bit of both. It's not just formal sitting. I'm also a huge um, practitioner and proponent. I really love walking meditation. Mm -hmm. And we do that. We have online retreats that are three days long, a lot of practices. It's eight hours a day of meditating. But to break it up and also to create a way of kind of infusing these states into our bodies as we move, I love walking meditation for that. So I kind of send everybody out with specific walking meditations and and they walk with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are these practices all about, would you say? What are we trying to see? What, What is spiritual awakening? Or maybe reframing that. What are we awakening to or what are we awakening out of, would you say? Yeah. It's so interesting. We are already enlightened. All of us, every single person is already enlightened. We're already divine. We're already pure, perfect beings. We're just not conscious of it. We're not living as it. 
So the practices that we do ultimately, I think, even if people are doing visualization, no matter what they're doing, they are practicing to wake up to that, to live and realize their own divinity, ultimately. That, for me, is the ultimate goal of spiritual awakening. And every practice that we do in the Elm Center is to, for two things, to either shed the layers, to release layers of resistance and layers of ego, which is really just separate self-identity, and also to connect more with that part of ourselves, to realize the oneness that we all are, to establish that. It's not even a connection because it's it's more intimate than that. A connection would imply I'm over here, you're over there, I want to have some kind of relationship, but a relationship isn't even possible if you're one. It's just this merging. It's yoga, I guess you could say, which is yep. unity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's simply about being able to see that, being able to see this very, very innate connection that isn't even a connection because we're so connected. We always were and we always will be. But for lack of a better word, seeing that connection and then what you're saying is working with that connection. Once you see it, you bring it out into the world and you almost use your life in the world as the meditation as well. So it's like a two-step process in a way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're embodying it out in the world. I think yeah. of Christ as sort of a prototype, um, like a template of a human being. Yeah. The perfect human being that we're all capable of becoming. It's not something worshipful that we should see out there, projected some divinity out there. It's in us now. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even think we need to learn or do anything. I think it's about just simply intending it and then aligning with it. All of these practices are almost unnecessary. They just prepare us for that, really. Yeah. It's just because we get in our own way. Mm -hmm. Yep. <sighs> they're unnecessary, but not until you do them enough to realize that they're unnecessary. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. People will people will say once they've reached a certain expanded state of consciousness, oh, meditation is unnecessary. You're perfect. You don't need to ever change who you are and just stay where you're at. Don't meditate. Don't bother because it's not needed. But They've meditated for 20 or 30 years. They've yeah. done the practices. Yeah, so it's so true. It's so true. It, once you get to that point of realizing that, oh, it was all, I could have just realized that, but you needed to get to the point of being able to realize that you didn't need it. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, I get it though. So if you want to get into it, you don't have to, but... How did you um, get on this wavelength? You know, how did you start walking the path? Like, what brought you to be able to see this yourself? Yeah, you know, I always tell the same story around this about my aunt giving me a book, and it was about crystals, and it had meditations in it, and that was the first time that I connected with practices, meditation practices that were really only meant to like develop relationships with crystals, so you could use them for magic, like ritual. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved the whole thing. I was probably about nine years old, but actually, I I feel like, and this is the first time I'm sharing this. I feel like that's not actually the case. I think I was given those books and that's wonderful. But I think I was just a sensitive kid and mm. really um, I had trouble in the world. Like I, my feelings were always so hurt and I was so like this bleeding heart all the time, even as I, I was very, very little. So I needed something to get me out of pain. I was also an, a, a victim of continual abuse. So that was also part of this journey in that like I needed something to kind of take me to another place in my consciousness so that I could have relief. So it started with just needing relief, which I don't think is that uncommon. People are suffering and they mm -hmm. want something to help to get them out of suffering. So I was, as a kid, I think suffering tremendously. Nobody knew that this person was 
they thought he was a wonderful guy. I'll just say that. So it was, it was difficult to live with. And I didn't really understand like why I was so sad, why I was feeling all of this stuff. All I knew is that these meditations with crystals was, it helped me to feel better. And then I started doing yoga. My mom's friend was a yoga teacher. So she would let us both take classes in her home. And I fell in love with yoga and I I became a yoga teacher later on in life. And then um, I started taking it really seriously, probably in my late twenties, I'm 46 now because I became suicidally depressed. I just, I, I hadn't dealt with my stuff. That's really what it was. I was just pushing it down and thinking everything's fine. I'm always fine. And it started, the shadows started coming up from all of this stuff that had gone on as a kid and other stuff. When I started working with it, it just, it was so freeing, so liberating. I started the practice of meditating for like six to eight hours a day. I had tons of time at that time in my life and that's how I chose to spend it. And it changed my whole life. That's when, and that's why I'm so interested in Kundalini because I did feel energy move unmistakably. Like it was not something I could have possibly been making up. And it fascinated me. It fascinated how me, how it moved my body and how I would get these symptoms and dreams and Shakti pot and visions. And it was amazing. And I don't really get those anymore. Mm. I think because the energy does, it integrates, it just becomes part of who you are. And now I, I wouldn't trade this feeling of well-being that just underlies everything, no matter what, for all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I feel that. That's from then to now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That relief, that feeling of well-being, I think is something that we all search for. We all yearn for. We just don't know how to go about finding it or seeing it per se. And most of our pursuits to it are outward pursuits. They're ephemeral. They're temporary. They're things that pretty much will never fill the void. Although the world conditions us into saying, this is what you need. You need the car. You need the money. You need the house. You need to look like this. You know, all of this temporary, just very shallow stuff. Um, so I think it's like something that we all want. We all, we're all suffering, you know, Buddhism 101 right there. But we just don't know how to go about um, um, transcending the suffering per se. So that's why I like to speak to people like you because you found the way out. <laughs> if you want to call it that, you know, you, you figured out how to truly find this relief and then spread it to the world. And that is priceless. Yeah, that's truly priceless. To be able to feel like that is, um, it's another miracle. It's like to actually feel like that and to not just say it, to actually bring that into your life and feel that way. It's, um, yeah, it's truly priceless. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't have anything else to say to that. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, awesome that people out there, that people are out there like you, you know, spreading the good word, because if not, there's so much delusion, there's so much illusion leading us into trying to fill the void in fruitless ways. So yeah, keep doing your thing. <laughs> keep doing your thing. And thank you for doing that. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's what the suffering is for, though? Do you think that's what our struggle is for in some way is to bring us all to this wavelength, to this point of seeing, seeing our innate divinity? You know, in one way or the other, we're going to get there. It's just like, how much do we have to put up with until we reach that point of exhaustion? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm. I think it totally sucks when you're in it like totally sucks. And I, I won't say that I don't have painful experiences, but the suffering isn't there because uh, it's not, there's no attachment. So I'll, I'll yeah. get angry or irritated or whatever. And it comes up and it's almost like it just, it can't stick. There's nothing for it to stick yep. to. So it just, yeah, it kind of flows. Um, but I think that suffering, <sighs> I have three children and my daughter has been, she's had a rough year, like one thing after the other. And I, 
it's not that I want to see her struggle and suffer, but I don't want to take away her suffering either because mm -hmm. she needs it to learn, to grow. There's, there's a point that it becomes, I guess, unnecessary because you are willing to look at yourself and learn in other ways. But for her right now, she needs to gain the self-awareness through the suffering. And, and it's almost a requirement in, in the earth school. Yeah. We kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's the base course, I guess. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In some way, I think that's why we all came here. It's through our suffering. Ultimately, it's to learn compassion, right? It's not only to see through the suffering, but it's like, as you see through it, what you're looking at is a compassionate wavelength. It's a compassionate way of seeing the world because you can also see that everyone else is suffering. So you have no other choice but to help out a little bit, as much as you can. You know, I like to say that um, in the seeing, my life has become a sort of offering. You don't have to take it, but I'm just throwing it out there. And I think that's what resonates. I don't know. That's just what resonates with me on this wavelength from doing all these practices and having these understandings and realizations dawn upon me. It's like, I have no other choice but to love essentially. <laughs> yeah. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not unconditionally loving everybody and everything, but I think that's where the journey, if you want to call it a journey leads to it's a uh, little by little day by day, you refine oneself and one's expression into a loving being towards the others that aren't really the others. No? They're not the others. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that is exactly it. I I feel like I want to get t-shirts. There are no others. Like Ramana Maharshi would say, yeah. there we're all one. And the suffering that I've experienced in my life, which has been, I mean, I've had plenty of suffering, just like we all have. I wouldn't even be able to talk to anybody if I hadn't suffered. I mm -hmm. can talk to people now who are going through extreme amounts of pain because I've been there. So I'm not afraid of them. I don't hold them at arm's length. I can be next to them. I can talk with them about it. I can be much more open hearted and have compassion in a different way than if I had never experienced any suffering. Like I wouldn't want any of my past suffering to change. Mm. And and I I feel like that's easy to say because I'm out of it. But even when the, the struggle comes up now, when something will come up that's difficult, there is this feeling in me of, oh, what's this, what's this gonna bring? What learning, what, what gateway am I gonna walk through? Because it's never yeah. failed to be something good on the other side, even mm -hmm. the really tough stuff. I know what you're saying. And you might not see the lesson in the midst of it, but if you can approach it with an open mind to be like, what's this for, right? And don't constrict yourself at the point of suffering you can it's easier to deal with but also when you deal with it afterwards it's like oh it all makes sense if you're able to approach the pain with an open mind easier said than done just throwing it out there is definitely easier said than done and i'm not perfect i don't welcome it all in and embrace it all but yes i do think with enough work and refinement and practice it gets a little bit uh it gets a little bit easier for sure day by day rome wasn't built in a day so uh yeah I feel that. I feel that. The proof is in the pudding, really. The only way that our words make sense to anybody listening is you just go through these practices, as you mentioned before, and you will notice a significant difference in your life. Like I just think personally, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, I was definitely suffering so much and I was doing it to myself. As you said in the beginning, we got to get out, get out of our own way. So essentially what I've done over these five, 10 years is got out of my own way. And the suffering really uh, hasn't gone down per se. If anything, as you get older, it uh, it only gets more and more dense. You know, it only uh, the afflictions only come in increasingly so. But I feel happier. I feel more at peace. Right. I feel more just aligned with a greater purpose that kind of goes beyond the suffering. And that is priceless, you know, if it's really just like you have to do these things, you have to be able to see this for yourself. There's only so much a podcast or a book or Ramana Maharshi 
is going to do for you. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there and just be a reminder. It's like, do it and feel the difference. And that's it. Just lead with that. And let me ask you that, actually. Um, do you feel as though there is like, once you tap in this intuitive guidance that kind of shows you the way, shows you what to do, depending upon the circumstance or whatever is going on in your life, that once you feel it within, like the heart leads the way in, in all the different circumstances of our life? Oh, absolutely. It's really interesting. There's a point in the spiritual journey because I do work with one-on-one one with people coaching them through spiritual awakening, essentially. But there's a point in almost everyone's spiritual journey where they feel a loss of motivation and this feeling like uh, they just don't want to do anything. Mm. And, and a lot of them will have this fearful feeling of like, will I ever get the motivation back or am I just going to be a lump on the couch? It's not motivation that they've lost. It's the motivation that came from fear. It's yeah. literally like our brain center that is all about fear and that actually shrinks our amygdala shrinks so that makes it so that we can follow our joy mm. and it takes a little bit for us to switch from that fear of am i going to get people's approval is my dad going to think this is okay i i have to make this much money to for my father to approve of me whatever it is that's all fear yeah. that goes away it can feel like you have no motivation but what happens is it switches to, oh, this lights me up. This is how I want to serve the world. And if you have an intention, I think intention is incredibly powerful, sort of like an ultimate intention that helps you to focus on one singular thing. Like for me, it's about embodying divinity and serving the world as my highest self. That's in every moment, just serving that's kind of my ultimate intention. So that's alignment. As long as I can remember that intention, I automatically stay in line with that. And then everything flows. I don't line up with anything less than that. And I know in my body, I can feel that it's pulling me. I just signed up for dog agility. I have a, a border collie. He's amazing. He needs an outlet. But I every time I would watch agility, these, you know, the obstacle courses that the dogs go through, I would get so emotional. I would actually cry and I would just feel like, God, that's so beautiful. Not everyone feels that. If you watched agility, you might be like, Yeah, that's cool, and not think much of it. But I would get this spark in me. So we signed up for agility. We start today because not even because I feel like I need to get great at it or like he needs to get great at it. Just because there's something in it, I know it. I can feel it in my body. The the emotions that well up, the way that I feel like, God, I would love to see him do that. That's the only sign that you need. You don't need more than that yeah. to move to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like this uh, resonant pull toward things. Absolutely. I feel yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily anything to do with the agility. Like yeah. maybe it is, but it also could be just that it opens something else up for me, but it's exactly. part of my path and I know it, I can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, uh, it's so present. It's so apparent, this intuitive resonance. It's, uh, and it goes beyond words as well. It's just like this feeling of just a very direct yes, very direct yes. And it goes the other way too for me. No. As well, I feel like a repulsion in things where I'm not supposed to be or supposed to do, you know. But yeah, call that intuition, the higher self, the Holy Spirit. It's real. It's very powerful. Very subtle. Very much so. Yeah. But very powerful. It's subtle until it's not because I do feel like um, I, I met my fiance two years ago. And just from doing this work, I feel like I'm more in, more sensitive Mm. to energy when it rises up in my body. And I didn't know his name. I didn't know anything about him. And I was like, hmm, yes. <laughs> I felt that yes. And it was very clear. It was an absolute yes. And the no's are the same way for me now. They've become clearer and clearer as, as I get in touch with the energy that's in me, my own body, the way that I operate, I can feel it more and more. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to put it, though. Yeah, it's a big yes. 
Yeah. It's a big yes. Follow the yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's real. It's real stuff. It is. Absolutely. And once you tap in, once you feel the yes, per se, kind of never leaves you, you know? It's like, uh, it's a superpower you always have. <laughs> we all have it. We all always have it. But it's like, once you know you have it, then you always know. And that, again, is priceless. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think we get confused only because we try to align with what is important to other people. Ooh. That's, I think that's where we kind of get yeah. a little lost. When people say that they're lost, I can almost guarantee just from having worked with a lot of people that they're trying to please someone else or they're trying to live up to standards that they don't have. It's not theirs. Mm -hmm. We all have that navigation system. It's really about like, like we keep saying, getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. We're all living in somebody else's standards. Yeah. And then those other people's standards are probably living in another person's standards. And it's just this chain of yeah. living for other people and not living for yourself. Oof. It's all illusion. Yeah. It's mm. all illusion. Yeah. Over yeah. centuries long, right? Not living for oneself, living for some other outward false idol. Yep. That's samsara right there. Yeah. It um, is. Yeah, this path, I mean, you can call it the Buddhist path, the yogic path, Christian path, whatever it is. I think it sows the seeds of accountability, true self-accountability, that you are the captain of the ship. And that may seem daunting, right? We're all looking for a savior, I feel like, in one way or the other. In that same essence of um, living for others, I think we also want others to save us. So that may seem daunting to the mind, right? The, the popular paradigm that we live under of looking for an external savior. But actually, that's the good news is that you are totally in control of how you want this movie of life to go. You can write the script how you want to write it. And that's how that's freeing. It's like that's how you free yourself is you literally you save yourself. <laughs> Nobody else is going to save you. So, yeah, on one hand, I can see why the mind would be like, oh, it's all up to me. But on the other hand, no, that's the good news. It's all up to you. Take that yeah. how you want to take it. <laughs> oh, that's that's the difference between living as a victim and living empowered. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you get yeah. to make the choice, which means you have to take full responsibility. Yeah. That's the sort of flip side. You have to choose how you're going to respond. Mm -hmm. Or else. Or else you're just going to yeah. keep suffering. Exactly. Hmm. Yep, that's the big yeah, I switch guess you too. Don't. Yeah, oh, it's huge. It's. I think that is a turning point in someone's life when they decide, oh, it's not everyone that I'm dating. <laughs> I'm the common factor in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know what the perpetrator is? It's ego. Oh, Our ego. Totally. They don't yes. want to look like the bad guy. The ego is never mm -hmm. the bad guy. It's not me. It's them. <laughs> it's yeah, always so, them yes yeah so isn't that's it funny thing. how everybody else is wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly ego is the main uh the main perpetrator of this whole thing but that's the thing that's got to die you know it's got to die and i think become reborn in some kind of way because everyone talks about ego death and you gotta yeah you gotta kill the ego in one way or the other i get that but then also i think there is still the ego of Gary or Re or whoever the listener is. Like we still, we still feel as though we have a place with our ego, our sense of separation. And I think it just becomes re-coordinated in this understanding. Like you just know how to utilize the ego. The ego is no longer the master. It's the servant to this greater self, to God, you could say. And in that is uh, that sense of freedom so that the ego doesn't call the shots anymore with its delusions and illusions of separation and competition and victim orientation you know it's like it still has a place the ego i feel as though maybe you can agree or disagree it still has a place 
in this thing we call life. It's just the matter. It becomes like a tool, I feel, you know, it becomes a tool for the divine to work through. Um, you know what I'm saying? Oh, 100%. It's super deep shadow work mm. to fall in love in a way with the ego without and, and not fall in love like you want to be attached to it, to love the ego and that it's, it's like a cute toddler that just doesn't know there's there's no yeah. reason to make it an enemy i mm. think that the the when you start resisting the ego when you start wanting to get rid of it it clings to you that's when you give yeah. it power because it's not real it's mm. just the conditioned parts of ourselves that believe that we're separate there's nothing real in that it's just this it's a construct so we're giving it power by saying i need to get rid of it it's bad it i need to find a way to have no ego. I feel like it's more about trans transmutating the shadows, bringing them up to because it's that's all that the ego could be seen as like kind of the ultimate shadow. It's mm -hmm. that sense of separation is suffering right there. So being able to have an open heart with it and and see it for what it is, it's just been trying to protect us. It's just been trying to love it in its own misguided way. And saying, like, I see you and you're not going to drive the car. You're yeah. not going to make the decisions. Yeah. And that's that's transmutation. That's mastery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then also seeing right through it. It's not real. We are not separate. I'm, I couldn't possibly, how could I possibly be separated from life? Exactly. It yeah, it's obvious. an impossibility. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, but the ego doesn't stop. That's the thing too. Is it's a constant transmutation process. It's a constant uh, alchemization that mm -hmm. this work leads us to. The mind stuff doesn't stop. That's the thing. The show goes on. It's just how we work with it. How we sort of uh, judo with it. You know how we sort of aikido and work with it rather than against it. That's the key, and that's the essence of flow. Uh, I like this saying, maybe this has to go along with it, maybe not, but Swami Muktananda says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. Yeah, That's kind of exactly. what I get, right? It's yes. kind of like the essence of the ego. You can't stop the waves of the mind and just the BS that comes along with it, but you know how to, you know how to work with it. You know how to go with it. And you can still, you know, direct yourself on the surfboard, right? You can still, <laughs> there's, there's still some control there. And going with the flow uh but ultimately it's like if you're going with the wave if you're going with the waves of the mind um you know how to transmutate the mind transmutate yourself amidst the waves and yeah that's what this whole work is about is not only yourself too but also transmutating how the world is all around you and you just ultimately uh create a better life and a better world for your community uh, just a just to better everything. Ultimately, I think that's what we do this for. And I think we spoke about this a little bit in the beginning is uh, what is this alchemization, transmutation, reorientation process all about? It's just about creating a better world, a better life, ultimately, I think. And that just comes naturally. I think that just is yeah. like a natural byproduct of the path is just outwardly shining this light to the world around you, to your family, to your community, to your friends. It's just kind of like innate. You don't even have to try. It's just naturally we are just loving and just that energy reverberates and uh, kumbaya, you know. It's, it's it may sound corny and cliche, but I really do think that's what's happening. And that's why we get aligned in the first place is so that we can escape this illusion and delusions that we've been living under for centuries. And bring about this new world, you know, new earth, as yes. they say, or the kingdom of heaven. Do you feel that? Do you feel as though we're moving oh, toward a better world? Absolutely. Oh, 100%. I think we're on the precipice of it right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not anything that needs to happen externally, as I'm sure, you know, we don't need to develop some new technology. Like, it's mm. about consciousness. And yeah. it's about a willingness to, to grow and to be united with other people rather than separate from them. Mm -hmm. And I think that anything that we can be really conscious with and really present with is 
that's what changes it. That's the transmutation process. That's where it all starts. I'm smoking. I don't want to smoke anymore. But instead of beating myself up, I'm just going to be with this cigarette and Hmm. slow down and feel every bit of it as it goes into my mouth, as I'm inhaling. If you are present with those things, you'll start to really realize how they feel. Like if you mindfully, slowly, consciously eat a donut, they taste like crap. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like you won't want to eat donuts anymore. You, it's not even that you're changing what's there. You're just becoming very aware, conscious. You're expanding your consciousness and you're aligning automatically with the highest potential. That's what we are designed to do. We're limitless beings. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Yes. And do you feel a sense of adventure, like the hero's journey? in living like some kind of uh you know purposeful living when you wake up in the morning you say here we go we're we're doing this thing do you feel more gumption in your actions from this oh yes 100 percent. it's funny that you say the hero's journey i'm a huge joseph campbell fan and i feel that way just about every day i'm excited to get up I wake up sometimes at like 3.30 in the morning because I just feel so, in. I feel so alive. I, I'm like, mm. oh, I don't want to waste time sleeping. Like I want to be, <laughs> I want to be awake. I want to be alive. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, I feel like I don't have to have a reason to be that way. I, I think a, for a long time, I felt like I had to find my purpose, discover my purpose, live my purpose, all this stuff, all this talk around purpose. And now it feels just the opposite. It's not about finding something that fulfills this purpose in me. It's like I can go to work and in this job that I would rather be doing my work in this space, the Elm Center, but I have a job where I, I'm an assistant stretcher for people. I can bring purpose to that. I can bring purpose to life, to my relationships, instead of waiting for it to happen externally. So that shift, that complete flip has changed everything. I haven't felt this lack of purpose in years. And I think that's, Mm. oh, it's such another conditioning that we've been kind of sold on, that we have to discover some passion, some purpose. I totally disagree with that. I think it's about bringing passion, bringing purpose to life, living the adventure. And I mean, you may not be able to do that in every moment in a conscious way, but just having the intention, again, the intention is everything. You don't need to learn something new. You don't need to read the next book. You don't need to meditate for 16 hours. Just I am choosing to live with purpose in this moment, in this workday. That's enough to align you. Everything Mm. you need to know is already, your subconscious mind has picked up on that a long time ago. You already know just being in alignment with it through intention and attention. What are you paying attention to? Mm -hmm. Amen. Very well said. Yeah. We bring the purpose out. That is a total 180 from how we were conditioned rather than looking for purpose is like it's right here we're bringing the purpose man we are the purpose <laughs> we are the purpose exactly yes mm. powerful stuff yeah i feel that and even in the monotony you could say even in the things even in our jobs even in doing the dishes even doing stuff that we don't necessarily want to do it's like how can i bring purpose into this and I feel like you don't even ask that question i mean it is about the intention but it's not even like i'm actively asking it's just as we said, resonant. It's just like a wavelength that you live on, right? It's like once you set the intention, preferably I would say at the beginning of the day and you wake up, set an intention and just, I don't know, follow that. It's not like this is an active thing. You know, it's not like you're, how do I put this? Because on one hand, it may sound, um, it may sound like work, right? It may sound tough. It's like, why would I got to pay the bills? Why would I want to do this? Well, actually what happens is enables one to pay the bills better you know enables one to in all the goings on of our life um navigate it just more smoothly and it's very 
it's just very natural. It's just like very, uh, there's nothing that you're, you have to do anymore. Just having this meditative mindset throughout your day isn't any more work. It's actually quite the contrary. Or it might seem like more work, you could say, but it doesn't feel like it. Like it just feels no. like you're just, you just, just doing what you need to do. And it's not like, it's not causing any more distress, you could say. Yeah, it's just, it makes life a little bit smoother, <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to say. Even it in really the stuff that does. doesn't seem smooth. Go ahead, sorry. Totally. Yeah, no, no. Um, totally. And it's, I think it's an effort to remember. That's what mm -hmm. I think is the issue. And actually, I, I say it so often. I have a potty training watch. I don't use it anymore, but I used to use it every single day. It vibrates to whatever time interval I set it to. And that would just remind me, Yeah. am I living in alignment? It would go off and I, I would ask myself those questions or I would just slow down and get really present, whatever the micro practice was mm. for that time period. Now it's just become a natural part of, of who I am and what I do. So I, I do think it's, it seems like you said, it seems like work, but oh my God, it's the most worth it thing because you can struggle and suffer and be in survival mode and just pay the bills until you die. Literally. Yeah. That could be your whole life. That is scary to me. <laughs> I don't want to live like that. I, I want to be alive and vital and, Use that energy that I spent in fear for so long for something else. I don't want to be designating my energy and my time to fear and mm -hmm. trying to survive. Mm. Yeah, very well said. And the thing is, too, as you spoke, it's very easy to align oneself. If one feels out of alignment, you just need a sort of totem to bring you back in. You know, you can set a reminder on your phone or your have a picture of a holy being on your wall or whatever it is, whatever it takes to come back into alignment, into the present moment, into this be here now-ness, you know, whatever it takes, um, go with that. Yeah, I have books that I just keep around that I'm not even reading, <laughs> books that I've read in the past that had a impact on me. I just keep them around, you know, on the shelf. Be here now, Ramdas. That's a perfect example. Just keep that right there. You know, whatever it takes, it's so easy to just get one's uh, self out of the mind stuff. Just go like, oh, of course. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend to everybody is uh, kind of play 5D chess with your mind. Insert oh, yeah. reminders. Oh, totally play with it. There was a story, I wish I could remember who exactly it was, but he wrote a book about it. He, as a joke, decided to dress and act like Jesus, like washing people's <laughs> feet, like just being kind wow. of a weirdo, honestly, because if we started dressing like Jesus and where he would wear his hair before his long hair, it changed his entire life. He said mm. that by the end of that year of dressing and acting like Jesus, it was not a joke anymore. He felt divine. He felt pure and he felt powerful. So that, that is powerful to align with that, even in wearing jewelry. Like there's a reason why people had totems and amulets and they work, they work. They're placebos and the placebo is one of the most powerful things that yeah. humanity is aware of. Yeah. If people say just the placebo, but oh my goodness, like the placebo can kill you or it can cure incurable yeah. disease. So let's use that. That's powerful stuff right there yeah it's a placebo until the placebo works and then it's real so, yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah it's the essence almost of fake it till you make it yeah yeah which if you're truly embodying it you're not faking anymore exactly <laughs> yeah yeah if you truly embody jesus you might end up christ-like you might end up in the christ consciousness and I think mm -hmm. that's the purpose of all of these sages of the past is uh, you take their lessons, you take their life and you follow in their footsteps, not directly, right? You don't directly become Jesus or the Buddha, but you take their lessons and transmit it into your own life, into your own lifestyle. You can definitely take some essences of their life and their lessons into your life. And then, yeah, I think that's the 
biggest purpose or the biggest thing that we got from the sages is uh, just the hmm, the embodiment and the epitome of what it means to be realized in just their living, just their essence of being here with us. You know, a lot of the sages of the past, they didn't even write anything down, which I think is interesting. They just kind of existed and people wrote about them. I think there's something powerful about that. So yeah, point of my story is um, whatever you got to do to remember, as we said, whatever you got to do. I prefer sages of the past personally, like the books of the past that have paved the way for us, but it comes in many different shapes and sizes, this sense of remembrance. We all have our own way back home to this remembrance. So whatever you got to do, man, whatever works, that's the beauty of it. Buddha had his own way. Jesus has his own way. I got my own way. You got your own way, but it's all the same destination per se. We're all uh, walking different paths to the same destination, you could say. So whatever path works for you, just go with that. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. No, you're good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it is different. It's like a a customized plan and a mm -hmm. customized lesson for, for everyone. Mm. Everybody's got their own version of the life school. Yeah, exactly. It's like we're all learning the same lesson, just in different classes maybe, you know? Mm. Because we're all, I think, eventually getting to a point of wiser, more loving beings. But it's like how you get there is different. You know, how you decide to walk the path, tread the path of your own suffering, essentially, is different for everybody. Hmm. So it's like, um, it's like simultaneously the same for all of us yet different in how i guess uh it plays out in the movie of your life you know <laughs> the ending's the same but the scenes are different in the movie and that's what's cool you know i wouldn't want to be like anybody else not that i could but i wouldn't want to live anybody else's life in anybody else's path i think it's cool that we become our own buddha in all of our own circumstances like that's uh that's very magical and that's beautiful to be able to do that and uh i think that way that the tread in the path of dharma is like infinite like every there's always new people here and because there's always new people here there's always new ways to tread the path and essentially that's like infinite purpose in that way like no matter what there's always a new way that the movie plays out and that's pretty cool you know <laughs> it's, pretty it's, cool. it's amazing oh yeah yeah and it's i i think that when you're living your life you are externalizing all of your stuff inside you're projecting it so you're always being shown the exact work that needs to be done mm -hmm. if you're getting angry at somebody for saying something and you're triggered over this thing it could be shadow work that you need to do more of like you are always being shown directly and very clearly exactly where the adjustment needs to be made within yourself yeah. it's never about out there it's always about an adjusting myself and and the truth is i've actually thought about this quite a bit even if it is about something i can do externally that i do have some measure of control over it's still about what i need to adjust within me because yep. i want to do this work mm -hmm. i want to show up every day until i can master this and that might take well who knows how long it could be the next minute it could be 10 lifetimes don't know yeah 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 and at that point it doesn't really matter right no no it doesn't <laughs> feel like it matters really at all um and then like it's kind of like well what's the point and i feel like well there is no point here we are <laughs> i just yeah. i don't know what the point could possibly be other than to ultimately live in this place where we are now as new beings and I don't need to fix anything to do that. I just mm. need to realize it. Mm -hmm. mm. Well said. Yeah. Wow. You know what? I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. Awesome. <laughs> I think we came full circle. That's a beautiful last note. You just have to realize it. You don't have to change anything. You just have to realize it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. 
Um, well, do you have anything else you want to say, though? Anything you want to get off your chest before we wrap this up? I think that we need more people in the world like you talking about these things in a loving way that's accessible. I think that there are more people doing this work and and just loving on each other. Like mm -hmm. you clearly have wonderful intentions and you're very warm and open. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting all of your guests. I, I feel like it's, this is good work. This is good work. And I, I, I know it's kind of seems like it's an offshoot, but for anybody out there listening right now who wants to do work like this, I would say, even if you do it in some small way yeah. where you're just bringing groups together or just talking with friends, like just love on people and preach love in all that you do. And only sometimes use words. Was that St. Francis who said that preach the gospel always and sometimes use words. Well, that's yeah. good. I never heard that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, I use a lot of words, so uh, maybe a contradiction. And words are magical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get it, though. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your kind words, and I appreciate your presence and energy and wisdom that you brought to this conversation. It's only possible because of people like you. You know, I don't like coming on the camera being by myself. I, I, uh, I flourish with others. So, yeah, I appreciate you coming on here and sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't have anything else to say. Peace and love to you and peace and love to the listener. Goodbye. Yes, everybody. peace and love. Absolutely. Bye.